Section 1. You will hear a man arranging to get a telephone connection. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. This is the Clearpoint Telephone Company Customer Service Office. My name is Ms. Jones. How may I help you? Yes, I'm moving and I'd like to arrange to have a phone line installed. The woman answers the phone. This is the Clearpoint Telephone Company Customer Service Office. So the words telephone company have been written at the top of the form. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. This is the Clearpoint Telephone Company Customer Service Office. My name is Ms. Jones. How may I help you? Yes, I'm moving and I'd like to arrange to have a phone line installed. Of course. Let me get some information from you first. May I have your name, please? It's Kramer, Harold Kramer. And would you spell your last name for me, please? K-R-A-M-E-R. M-E-R. -E Got it. Okay. Could I have the address where you'd like to have the telephone connected? That would be number 58, Fulton Avenue, apartment 12. Is that a business or a residence? A residence. It's my new home address. Then the type of phone service you want is residential, not business? Yes, yes. It's for my home. All right. Fine. Now, let me get your employment information. Who is your current employer? I work at the Wrightsville Medical Group. Then your occupation is doctor? Uh, no, I work for the doctors. I'm the office manager. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Okay, and could I have your work phone number? It's 637-555-9014. 9014. Great. Just one more thing. I need to know how long you've been at your current job. I've been working there for quite a while now. Let me see. Eight? No, nine. That's right. Nine years. Okay, good. You've been there long enough, so I don't need to ask about any other work history. Now, in addition to our basic phone service, we have several special services available. Could you explain them to me? Most customers opt for unlimited long-distance service. It really saves you money if you make a lot of long-distance calls. That sounds like a good idea. Then I'll put you down for long-distance service. Another popular service is voicemail. Voicemail takes all your messages electronically, and all it takes is one simple phone call to retrieve them. Hmm, voicemail. No, I don't think so. I have an answering machine to take my messages. It's old, but it still works fine. We also provide internet service if you're interested in that. I am. Please put me down for internet as well as phone service. Right. Okay, I think we're almost finished. I just need to schedule a time for the technician to go to your apartment and do the installation. Let me see. What about next Tuesday? Would that work for you? Uh, no, not Tuesday. I'll be at a conference all day. Wednesday would work, though. I'm afraid I won't have any technicians in your area on Wednesday. I could send someone on Friday. That would be fine. What time of day works best for you? Morning or afternoon? Morning would be best. All right, then. It's on the schedule. Do you have any questions? No, I don't think so. Thank you for calling Clearpoint. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear a man giving a welcome speech to new students at the University of Westley. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully to the welcome speech and answer questions 11 to 14. Hello and good afternoon. My name is John Walker and I'd like to welcome you new students to the University of Westley. What I'm going to do today is just explain to you some of the facilities that you'll find here on our main campus and where you'll find them. If you look at the map on the overhead projector, let me talk you through some of the locations before describing some of them in more detail. Well, at present, we're in the university's main lecture hall. If you go out of the main front entrance, then you will see opposite across the car park the entrance for the focal point of a lot of university life for most students. This is, of course, the Students' Union. About 150 yards on the left of the union, as you look at it from here, is another focal point for the students, though not as popular as the union the University Library. Behind the library is the main university refectory, where many students eat both lunch and dinner. On the other side of the Union is the College Chapel, and behind that there is a small hall of residence. There are three other halls of residence behind the Students' Union. Behind the hall that we're in now is the Sports Hall and Grounds and either side of us are academic departments with lecturers' offices, lecture halls, and various labs. You'll find it all a bit confusing at first, but you'll get to know your way around fairly quickly. You now have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the welcome speech and answer questions 15 to 20. I'd like now to talk about a few important places on the campus. All students must belong to the Students' Union if they wish to use any of its services. It's very cheap and we certainly recommend that you join. The Union provides a bookshop covering all the course books at the University plus lots of other titles for a range of interests. You can eat and drink at the Union. There is a fat Phillips on the ground floor, serving a wide range of fast foods and drinks. Then there is the main Union bar up on the first floor. This is where the Union parties, dances and balls are held. And there's a pizza corner where cheap, large pizzas can be served up in a few minutes. Other areas that will be of interest to students are the welfare office, the travel office and the club's office. The club's office will get you in touch with all the clubs that are part of the students' union. These clubs vary from football to drama to potholing to beer drinking. There really is something for everyone. The union opens up at 8am every day and closes at 12 midnight, unless there are any functions going on later. I'd like to move on to the library now. This is where a lot of you will, I hope, be spending a lot of time over the next three or four years, working and doing research. Of course, this isn't as exciting as the social aspects of university life, but of course it really is the main reason that you are all here. I therefore urge you to get over there as soon as you can, as you have to register, and then you can have a look around. During the first two weeks of the academic year, that is, now, there are tours every two hours aimed at familiarising new students to all the surfaces that the library offers. The library is open from 9am to 9pm, though it stays open later during final exams. As I said earlier, 
The refectory is behind the library. The refectory offers a range of cheap meals at lunch times and in the evenings. It's open from 12 noon to 3 p.m. for lunch and from 6 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. for dinner. They try to offer a variety of food from favourites to healthy options to ethnic foods and there's always a choice for vegetarians and vegans. The University Sports Hall is one of the most used buildings at the University. To use the hall or the grounds you must be a member of the Athletic Union which is part of the Students' Union. Again, this costs very little and will allow you to use all university sports facilities, represent university teams and it fully ensures you during your membership of the Athletic Union. This is really excellent value. For departments and academic facilities there isn't enough time to go through all of them but your respective departments should furnish you with maps and information that will satisfy your needs. For all services offered at the University, I recommend that you purchase a Discount Plus card. This card costs £50 and lasts for the academic year. It will then give you discounts on all services at the University. For instance, a £4 meal at the refectory would be reduced to £2.50. It will also give you free usage of the late night minibus that the University runs to places off campus which normally costs a pound. You can see that it wouldn't take very long to make it worthwhile. The cards can be bought at the Students' Union. Well, that's what I have to say for the moment. Now, are there any questions? That is the end of Section 2. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 3. Section 3. In this section, you will hear two talks about London's parks and some interesting places. Look at the forms and fill the missing information in the correct boxes. Look at questions 21 to 33. Note the examples that have been done for you. Now listen to the first talk and answer questions 21 to 25. Here are some figures for the number of tourists visiting the Royal Parks. The Royal Parks are the property of the Crown and were originally the grounds of Royal Homes or Palaces. In central London, these include Hyde Park, originally a hunting forest belonging to Henry VIII. It now consists of 340 acres of trees and grass intersected by paths, with boating and swimming on the Serpentine Lake, and horse riding in Rotten Row. Hyde Park is one of the most popular attractions. In 1990, almost 20,000 people visited the park. Kensington Gardens are formal gardens covering 274 acres and containing Kensington Palace. There you can visit the Round Pond, the Albert Memorial, and the statue of Peter Pan, the famous fairy tale figure created by Barry. About 10,000 people visited the park in 1990. Regent's Park was also part of Henry VIII's hunting forest in the 16th century. Today it contains the London Zoo, a boating lake, the Regent's Canal and an open-air theatre. It is one of the most popular attractions with over 25,000 visitors each year. The number of visitors to Regent's Park increased after a children's zoo was opened, resulting in a sharp rise from 25,000 to 32,000 in 1990.
Now listen to the second talk and answer questions 26 to 33. Tick the relevant boxes in each column. First, look at questions 26 to 33. Now listen to the second talk and answer questions 26 to 33. There is so much to see and do in London. It's hard to know where to start, so in order to help you, we've listed the major attractions, places of interest and museums in inner London. If it's open to the public, tick in the table. If not, make a cross in the correct column. The Barbican Centre is a very good place to visit. It has excellent facilities for a wide range of cultural activities, all under one roof. Concerts, plays, art exhibitions and films. Home of the world-famous London Symphony Orchestra and the Royal Shakespeare Company, it also offers informal events and performances at lunchtime, early evening and at weekends. It is open from 9 o'clock in the morning until 11 o'clock at night. Mondays to Saturdays from noon to 11 p.m. Sundays and public holidays. For performances, telephone 01-6384-141, extension 218. The underground stations are Moorgate and Barbican. Madame Tussauds is the place where wax figures of famous and infamous people can be found. It is open daily from 9 a.m to 5.30 p.m., including weekends. The underground station is Baker Street. St. James's Palace is at the corner of St. James's Street and Paul Moor. It is a royal palace within walking distance of Piccadilly Circus and is not open to the public. The chapel is open to the public for the Sunday morning service at 11.15. You can get off at Green Park Underground Station. The Museum of London illustrates the history and topography of London from prehistoric times to the present day. Admission is free. Opening times Tuesdays to Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Sundays 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. You can get off at St. Paul's Barbican and Moorgate Underground stations. Buckingham Palace is the London home of the Queen. When the Queen is in residence, the Royal Standard is flown from the flagstaff. It is generally not open to the public, however, visitors are admitted to the Queen's Gallery. The underground stations are Victoria, St James's Park and Green Park. You are welcome to London and we hope you have an enjoyable time here. Thank you. That's the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Black Bear. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 35 on page 126. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 35. The black bear, or Ursus americanus, has a wide range inhabiting forested areas of North America, including Canada, the United States, and parts of northern Mexico. Black bears are omnivores, getting their nutrition from a wide variety of plants and animals. 
The particular foods any one bear eats depends on what's available in the area where that bear lives, as well as on the season of the year. Generally speaking, plant foods make up 90% of the bear's diet. The rest of its meals consist of animal foods such as insects and fish. Bears have a relatively long gestation period. Mating takes place in the spring or early summer, but bear cubs aren't born until the following winter. Usually, two cubs are born at a time, although some litters may have as many as five cubs. Bear cubs are dependent on their mother and may stay with her for close to two years. Wild black bears can live as long as 25 years. They've lived for as long as 30 years or more in captivity. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 36 to 40 on page 126. Now listen carefully and answer questions 36 to 40. Much of the black bear's range coincides with the range of its close cousin, the grizzly bear. Although these bears are somewhat similar in appearance and habits, it isn't difficult to tell the difference between them. Colour isn't necessarily a distinguishing characteristic, as both species of bears occur in a range of colours from almost blonde to dark brown or black. Many black bears, however, have a patch of fur on their chests that's lighter in colour than the rest of their fur. Grizzly bears don't have this patch. Size isn't always a distinguishing feature either, although grizzly bears are usually heavier with an average weight of 225 kilos. Black bears average 140 kilos in weight. Grizzly bears spend time digging in the ground for roots and tubers that make up part of their diet. The large muscles they need for this give them a distinct shoulder hump. This hump is absent in black bears, which don't do the same kind of digging. The shape of the face and ears is also different in each species of bear. Grizzly bears have a depression between the eyes and nose and short round ears. Black bears, on the other hand, have a straighter profile and longer, more pointed ears. Grizzly bears are known for their fearsome, long, sharp claws. Black bears have shorter claws, which are better suited for climbing trees. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.